YouTube channel intended for students in undergraduate mathematics. I've often wanted to start a math course with some of my personal heartfelt advice for learning mathematics. Everyone appreciates art, right? Well, maybe not everyone, most people, some more than others. But for sheer beauty, I would rank the beauty of nature above that of art. Most people really appreciate the beauty of nature, but this can't be appreciated as easily from a photograph. To really understand how beautiful the view is from a mountaintop, you really have to climb the mountain and see the view for yourself. Not everyone climbs the mountain, either because they're physically unable to do so, or because they're too busy doing something else. So, there is some beauty that is not experienced. A good example of this is the beauty of the Earth, as viewed from the Moon by Apollo astronauts, something that almost none of us will ever be able to experience firsthand. You should go to the Wikipedia page for this photograph, Earthrise, and listen to the audio recording of the Apollo 8 astronauts trying to describe their amazement at what they're seeing. We can only imagine. Mathematics is like that. Most people don't pursue it far enough to learn what it really is. But for these few, it's pure fascination. I have no hesitation in saying that the most beauty and amazement I've ever personally experienced is in mathematics. Oh, well, okay, so let me add physics. I realize this is difficult to convey to someone who hasn't taken the path that I have. Reading mathematics is not like reading a novel. Math books are bound in a similar way to novels, but the similarity pretty much ends there. Reading mathematics can be slow going. I was always a slow reader anyway, so I think that may be how I got started doing mathematics. When you read mathematics, you need to open your mind. Expect insights. Expect a challenge. But expect also to be enlightened. Expect to learn ideas that will fill your head during all your free moments. Ideas that you'll just want to share with everyone you meet. Ideas that will blow your mind because it was written by a mathematician. And mathematicians don't waste their time with boring or useless stuff, right? I've been learning mathematics for most of my life, which means for decades. I always find that when I approach a lecture or a book with the right frame of mind, I'm rewarded. I can't honestly say that about every subject, but I can honestly say that about mathematics. If that has not been your experience, if you can't understand a lecture, or when you find yourself staring at this book for hours and you can't seem to push your way through it, you're telling yourself that this stuff makes no sense at all. What do you do? How do you break through that impasse? For starters, learning mathematics, more than just about anything, is a very sequential process. Robert Osterman has said, we are dealing here with a fundamental and almost paradoxical difficulty. Stated briefly, it is that learning is sequential but knowledge is not. A branch of mathematics consists of an intricate network of interrelated facts, each of which contributes to the understanding of those around it. When confronted with this network for the first time, we are forced to follow a particular path, which involves a somewhat arbitrary ordering of the facts. Most students who are turned off by mathematics end up this way because they have skipped some of the steps leading to frustration and discouragement. In this case, there's nothing for it but to go back and cover the prerequisites. Many students fail in calculus because they don't understand maybe fractions or decimals or exponentials, trig functions, maybe even polynomials. Often they're seriously confused about what even a function is. Better to go back and learn the prerequisites before coming into calculus. I have found myself facing such an impasse, sitting and staring at a math book. I find that 
at that point, it's better to stand up, get the blood moving, and start writing things, well, right on the board in my office, or just a pad of paper, depending where I am. Starting with maybe the basic definitions, a few key examples, and the right book or two, I start working through some of the relevant details for myself. Soon enough, I can reproduce maybe the entire train of thought from start to finish. Also, I find it's a good idea to explain it aloud to someone else, have them ask me questions, or explain it back to me. If you want to understand something yourself, there's nothing better than trying to explain it aloud to someone else. If I'm confused about something, it's often at that point that it becomes clear. On the subject of persistence, it is said that when Gautama Buddha sat under the fig tree, he didn't move for 49 days until he had attained enlightenment. Sometimes I've struggled at a crucial point in a math text, refusing to move well, just for an hour or two, waiting for the light to come on in my head, and then I can't take it anymore, I need to get up and go to the bathroom. Often it's at that moment when I start moving that everything becomes clear to me. If I'm not understanding what I'm reading, at least I'm confident that the problem is not with the mathematics, it's with me. Such is the confidence that I now have in mathematics. And the more experience you have with overcoming that impasse, the more confidence you'll have in the reasonableness of mathematics, the relevance and the efficacy and the potency of mathematical ideas, and the more prepared your mind is to accept the insights that are waiting to be grasped. One story you should learn is the story of the student, the fish, and Agassiz. You can look up the full story on Google. The student in 1849 wants to learn biology under the great Professor Louis Agassiz, who went on to found the School of Science at Harvard University. The professor handed the student a specimen jar containing a preserved fish and sent the student to the lab to examine it. Spoiler alert, I'll reveal the ending by saying that the student did become very passionate about not just fish in general, but about this species of fish, and even this particular fish. He came to view this as the most valuable investigation he had ever undertaken in his life. But during the first week or two, he found nothing at all of interest in this one dead fish. He sat staring at it until it stank and filled him with loathing. The professor was not much help. Just look at your fish, he would say. Look at it. It has so much to tell you. Yeah, right. I would say that persistence is often necessary, but knocking your head against a wall is counterproductive. Mathematics is a language. How did you learn English? Not by reading a textbook of grammar, not at first, but rather by imitation. You hear grown-ups around you speaking sentences. You repeat a few simple sentences, gradually start making up longer longer sentences. You make some mistakes. Someone corrects you. You repeat back the corrected sentences. All the while, you're testing your guesses of what the rules are. And through practice, you refine your intuition of how language works. Learning mathematics is no different from that. You cannot expect to say everything right the first time, but you will need to accept correction and practice a lot if you expect to learn. And remember that communication is two-way. To improve your comprehension, you must practice reading and listening to mathematics, but you must also practice writing and speaking it, just as it would be if you were learning Spanish or Mandarin or Swahili. When you write or say something that isn't right, you'll need to work on that. Mathematics has the highest standards of expression and language of any discipline. You'll need to work on expressing your thoughts correctly, precisely, and without ambiguity. As an example of what not to do, do not ever write something like this. 
Take a look at what I'm showing you on the screen. What's wrong with this? Pause the video and discuss. Pause the video, seriously. How would you write this better? Okay, now that you've resumed the video, what is the student here trying to say? So this would be better. If 2x is 14, then x is 7. Absolutely, the biggest problem students have is throwing everything into one bag and then dumping everything out again in random order when they need something, like alphabet soup. And by the way, while taking notes in class, write down verbatim what your instructor writes and says. Don't rewrite or abbreviate. If your instructor knows their salt, they're trying to model how you should write. And if the teacher isn't a good model, then I guess you're just going to have to learn from somewhere else, like the textbook or someone else who knows. If you think you can safely paraphrase something in a book or a lecture, think again. Most things that you're likely to learn in an undergraduate math class have been explained in thousands of textbooks written over several decades. The explanations have already been refined to their purest essence. And until you reach the level of expert, you're not going to find anything you can say any better or more simply without sacrificing correctness. Everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. Well, that's a very loose paraphrase of something Einstein said. Now let's try to clear up a few misconceptions about some special words. In the undergraduate math curriculum, we teach courses of a more theoretical nature and courses of a more practical nature. On top of that, many courses, whether a theoretical or practical nature, make use of theorems, either implicitly or explicitly. Students are always confused about these terms. For example, the word theorem. A theorem is a uniquely mathematical term. It refers to a statement that is known to be true because it has been proved. A good example is the theorem of Pythagoras, which is true, at least in the context of Euclidean geometry. It's a very useful fact with many practical applications. You may or may not have seen a proof of this theorem. Possibly you would. But we all use the theorem of Pythagoras in a practical way in many mathematical contexts. In a practical course, you wouldn't worry about the proof. You simply use the theorem to work out the length of the hypotenuse of a right triangle whenever you need to. You never worry about trying to prove the theorem because you simply trust that someone else has done that for you. Also, the word theory is quite different from theorem. The contrast between theory and practice is not at all specific to mathematics, and that appears in many contexts, many disciplines. A good example, let's say you want to learn about <clears throat> automobiles. Very good. Learn about automobiles. So how do you do that? Do you sign up for a course in driver's education? Maybe a course in auto mechanics or even an automotive engineering program? Well, these three options are very different. The second choice trains you to be an auto mechanic, and the third choice will train you for more. You could work for a car manufacturer, maybe designing and testing new automobiles. Both of those programs are very selective and entail a much deeper study of automobiles. For that, you'll need to learn a lot more theory, more of the basic principles behind how automobiles work, starting with the theory of internal combustion engines. Oh no, you say, you want to learn how a car works. You want to learn how to drive a car. Yes, sorry, I misunderstood. If you take a course in driver's education, they will teach you to sit in the driver's seat. You put your foot on the brake and turn the ignition until the car starts, switch into drive, lit up on the gas, etc. all the steps of learning to drive a car. Very practical, and for most people, that may be enough. Especially if you don't want to work on your own car, just trust the mechanic and pay him to do all the repairs for you. Now we're talking about the difference between theory and practice. In the world 
of undergraduate mathematics courses, calculus is a practical course that should be compared to driver's education. Here you won't learn the hows and whys of mathematics, just the practice of using it. You'll encounter several theorems, but you won't prove them, probably not. Just take them for granted and learn how to use the tools to calculate the answers in some practical instances. If you want to go deeper and understand the hows and whys, you can then take a sequence of analysis courses, which will provide the theory, often at the junior and senior level. Put another way, calculus is like analysis, but without the theory. We leave out the proofs and teach you how to start your car, follow the rules of the road, etc. The same distinction holds to varying degrees in other math courses. For example, in linear algebra, you start off with the practical side, learning algorithms like Gaussian elimination. You will probably learn some theory in a sophomore course in linear algebra, possibly learning how to prove a few theorems, but still with a more practical emphasis on algorithms and computation until you get to the senior level or possibly even graduate courses. You see, a theory is quite different from a theorem. The word theory is a broad term, a high-level term for a general body of knowledge, possibly a set of principles, such as the theory of differential equations, or social theory, or political theory. These refer to entire subject areas, not specific facts. And we're not using the word theory, by the way, in that very different sense of hypothesis especially a questionable hypothesis. You have a new theory about the brontosaurus. Well, well um, can I just uh, say that I have a new theory about the brontosaurus? You can safely assume, at least in mathematics, that theory does not refer to a half-baked idea. We would be very careful to call something like that a question or a conjecture to distinguish it from fact. Mm.